Дуже дякуємо, що приєдналися сьогодні до case review with Astro Experts for Ukraine. Today we have a great session on breast cancer and we have two amazing speakers, Dr. Jonathan Strauss from US and Dr. Natalia Seryogina from Ukraine. Dr. Strauss is a professor and vice chair of um, education, and he is also a director of breast service at the Department of Radiation Oncology at Northwestern uh, University uh, in Chicago. Uh, he earned his MD and MBA from University of, in Chicago and completed a residency in radiation oncology at Rush. In 2009, he joined Northwestern as a faculty, and he's an active and prolific researcher. He's focused on adopting and studying new technologies in the treatment of breast and GYN cancers to optimize cancer outcomes while minimizing damage to normal tissues. He's published more than 90 journal articles and book chapters. And our second speaker is Dr. Natalia Seryogina. Uh, she is one of the leaders of radiation oncology in Ukraine and the chair of radiation oncology department in Tomo Clinic in Kropovnitsky, Ukraine. Uh, she has 20 years of experience in radiation oncology and Tomo Clinic Center was the first center in Ukraine that performed uh, TBI treatments and also their team was one of the first who started using hyperfractionation for uh, breast cancer. In 2022, she was awarded by Public Medical Community the award of uh, St. Pantalimon. Congratulations, Dr. Sirogina. We are mm -hmm. very excited to um, hear your lecture today. Uh, Dr. Strauss, please, um, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. I'm honored for the invitation to be here, and I really hope this is going to be uh, helpful for the team. So feel free to ask questions. I hope that these slides, any of you who want them can have them as a resource if they help in some way. Um, so we'll go to the next slide and the next. And so we're, this lecture is divided into three cases. The first is a woman with DCIS. She's 43 years old and she presents with pleomorphic microcalcifications uh, on a screening mammogram, as we can see over on the right. And this is how DCIS is typically found because it's not usually palpable. So her physical examination is normal. And we move on to a stereotactic corneal biopsy that shows DCIS grade two that's ERPR positive. And she undergoes breast conservation, showing that that DCIS measures 1.8 centimeters with margins closest to three millimeters. So I present a few, case, a few questions for us that we'll then look into the data for. Should she re-excise? What kind of radiation can or should she do? Um, should she do radiotherapy at all? Next slide. First question, the margin question. And when I have a margin question on DCIS, I go to our big consensus statement published by Monica Morrow a handful of years ago. And so for women who would receive breast radiotherapy, we learn that a positive margin, which is defined as ink on the tumor, we should probably re-excise. That a margin less than two millimeters, we may want to re-excise. And that if our margins are at least two millimeters, we should absolutely not routinely re-excise. Since our patient had three millimeters, we feel comfortable with that approach. Next slide, please. Now I'll point out that there were four randomized trials of radiotherapy in DCIS um, for women with relatively unselected DCIS. And that everyone looked at essentially 50 gray and 25 fractions versus observation and found that 50 gray and 25 fractions cut the risk of recurrence at least in half. In DCIS, unlike invasive cancer, we didn't change survival. Next slide. And we even have some data looking at a boost above and beyond 50 gray and 25 fractions. And what we see is that the boost cuts that residual risk of recurrence almost in half, maybe by about another 40% relatively. And that's exactly what we saw in invasive cancer, and we'll look at that too. 
By contrast, we also see that there's absolutely no difference between conventional fractionation by two great per fraction or moderate hypofractionation. Either regimen was equally effective. Next slide, please. So, okay, if we want to minimize risk of recurrence, we saw that radiotherapy to 50 grand 25 fractions cut our risk in, of recurrence in half and a boost cut it almost in half again. But for which patients do we think we can do less? For which patients could we maybe omit radiotherapy? Well, we have a couple of prospective series. The first is ECOG E5194, which took women who either had grade one and two cancer DCIS less than two and a half centimeters or grade three less than one centimeter. About a third of them received tamoxifen. The median size of these was very small. And we saw by 12 years in the grade three group, even if it was really small, even if it was widely excised, the 12 year risk of an IBTR was almost 25%. And in grade one and two, it was 14 and a half percent. Okay, not great. Next slide, please. We see very similar data in our one randomized trial, RTOG 9804. This only looked at the grade one to two subset. This time about two thirds of them received tamoxifen. They were very small and widely excised. And by this time we see the 12 year results with no RT, again, most of them getting endocrine therapy. We see the risk of recurrence at 11.4%. Uh, again, okay, not amazing. Next, next slide, please. One way we can estimate risk is by using an online nomogram. So here I use the most commonly cited, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center nomogram for DCIS. And this is done online, but you can also do it manually like I show here. I put in the exact criteria for our patient who we just discussed, and we see a 10-year risk with no radiotherapy with an antiestrogen of around 12%, which looks very much like what we saw in our randomized trials. That's reasonable, but a young, healthy person probably doesn't want that. Next slide, please. So she decides to do radiotherapy, and we can see why. What treatment options are available to her? We've talked a bit about whole breast radiotherapy, but let's see what else there is. Next slide, please. And so here I point out that partial breast radiotherapy comes in several forms. Uh, the form I like to use is an external beam partial breast. Here we're looking at maybe 3D conformal, but it can very well, I often do it with IMRT. And then there are various forms of breast brachytherapy, multi-channel, multi-plane interstitial approaches, which I think have quite good data, and then single entry devices, which I think have somewhat less good data. Next slide. And so I actually break up partial breast trials into two groups. Not everybody does, but I break them up into two groups. One based on rather large volume that's treating the lumpectomy bed, plus usually at least two centimeters around it. And if we look at all of those trials, in every single one, we see equivalence but in the risk of in-breast control between whole breast radiotherapy and this kind of larger volume partial breast. This is true for the multi-catheter Jack Estro trial. It's true for the Florence trial that used IMRT six gray times five fractions in um, non-consecutive days. It's true for the UK import low trial. This used just mini tangents, and I have I kind of show this often to the top right of what their partial breast fields look like. Large volume mini tangents, 4005 gray in the mini tangents. That looked great and just as good as whole breast. There was the Canadian rapid trial. This used 3D conformal radiotherapy, 3.85 gray times 10 BID. It gave relatively poor cosmetic outcome because that is an awful lot of dose. And then the NSABP B39 trial in which the external beam, the larger volume approach, again, 38.5 BID. Again, we usually don't use that approach because of bad cosmesis, but in every one of these trials, we see excellent oncologic outcomes. Next slide, please. And by contrast, we have a few trials that use much smaller techniques. The Elliott trial, which used an intraoperative electron technique, target A trial, which used an intraoperative photon technique where everything's prescribed just to the surface of the applicator and we're getting an effective dose probably a few millimeters deep. Or the other portions, the other patients treated on NSCBPB39, like most of them with single entry balloon devices. And in each of these either trials or subsets of trials, what we see 
is probably inferior outcomes. So I actually think partial breast is probably great. I advise people to probably use a larger volume technique. Those seem to be much better proven. Next slide, please. And then here we have an updated astro consensus on which patients qualify for PBI. And so here we can see the patients they think are great. First, invasive, they say grade one or two, ER positive, age greater than 40, T1N0, or any DCIS that's grade one or two in a patient over 40, smaller than two centimeters. And then they say, you know what, you could also do partial breast for that next column, which is basically people with tumors that go up to three centimeters or maybe are grade three. And then they lift some things where we really shouldn't probably be doing partial breast irradiation. And these are for patients with lymph vascular invasion, positive nodes, positive margins, BRCA mutations, or HER2 patients who don't get any anti-HER2 therapy. Next slide, please. And so our patient, who remember had a small grade two DCIS, she wants to do the quickest and easiest option with the least toxicity. So, and here's our first poll question, which option should she choose? Whole breast radiotherapy, 50 gray and 25 fractions. Whole breast radiotherapy, 40, 40 gray and 15 fractions and a boost. And I'll mention that boost could be given sequentially or it could be given concurrently. I think either one of those options is great. Partial breast radiation, 38.5 gray and 10 fractions, BID, like the rapid trial or B39 or partial breast radiation, 30 gray and five fractions, QOD delivered with IMRT, like the Florence trial, which is the quickest, easiest option with the least toxicity. First off, I just love how many people are voting. There's really, really a good rate of participation. We take attendance by uh, participation in uh, Zoom polling. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. So we have around 86% participating. A few more answers, please. Okay, I'm um, ending the poll and sharing results. So let's see, um, maybe I just can't tell. Oh, the bottom category is 27 bits. So here's what I'll say. I selected four regimens that are all oncologically very reasonable, but I agree with, with answer four because she asked for the mm -hmm. quickest and easiest approach with the least toxicity. And so neither the five week nor the three to four week regimen are gonna be the quickest. A partial breast approach 10, gray, uh, 10 fractions BID, we know had kind of higher cosmetic toxicity, more of the induration and such in the breast because it was such a high dose to a big volume. So really the best combination of speed and toxicity is gonna be the partial breast by the Florence trial, which was six gray times five fractions every other day delivered with IMRT. And if you use that approach, not only do you find that you keep, you know, your throughput really goes high, you can get people through quite quickly because it only uses five fractions, but also the cosmetic outcomes are really wonderful and it's oncologically equivalent. So I'd encourage for, uh, answer four. Okay, thank you. Let's see, I'm going to close that and then we'll go to the next slide. And so if we're contouring for partial breast irradiation, how should we do it? There are multiple ways. Here I cite the Jack Estro Contouring Atlas. And what they suggest is that you can you know, window carefully so you can really see the cavity. You delineate the cavity on the basis of clips and seroma, but you exclude any sharp irregularities, any point where the seroma kind of pokes out really sharply. And then they expand to a CTV of 20 millimeters, but where they're adding together the surgical margin plus an expansion. So at each edge, if at the medial edge your tumor's five millimeters from the margin, then you add 15 millimeters of CTV. 
If it's 15 millimeters from the margin, you add five millimeters of CTV. So that they're, they're kind of tailoring the CTV. It's not just a circumferential expansion, but they're tailoring it for the tumor margins on tissue. And alternatively, you could just do a 15 millimeter expansion around your seroma. That's also very reasonable. And then you do some expansion to PTV and your expansion to PTV should in part be influenced by how good you think your setup is. Do you have onboard imaging or not? Next slide, please. And then when you're contouring your targets, you should also be contouring normal structures. And in, the, in this setting, the normal structures should include the ipsilateral lung and the contralateral lung, the heart, but if you can, also cardiac substructures. And I will say for left-sided breast cancer, we tend to contour not just the heart, but also the left anterior descending artery and the left ventricle. And then we have OAR constraints for all of those. Um, on the right side, we don't, but it'd be reasonable to contour the right ventricle um, or the right coronary artery. Um, and if you need an atlas, we have one linked here. Next slide, please. So then you need to set organ at risk constraints. And you should have these for us. We put together a list of organ at risk constraints from a series of different sources. And then what we did was scale it on the basis of dose. And so if we were treating 50 gray, each of these constraints um, scale higher since this is a 30 gray and five fractions, our constraints kind of scale lower. I'm not saying these are magical constraints that everyone needs to follow, but I think they're helpful. And we're gonna see that depending on whether we're doing 3D conformal or IMRT, we have trouble with different constraints. And we'll see that uh, a little bit later in the lecture. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna jump to the next case um, I know if anyone has questions about this first case, I know we're going to have a Q&A time a little bit later. But the next case we're going to go to is a similar patient, but she has an early stage breast cancer. So in this case, a 41-year-old woman presents with a palpable mass in the left breast. And physical exam shows us a three centimeter mobile firm mass in the upper outer quadrant. It presents as a suspicious mass with speculated borders on mammography. On ultrasound, it's hypoechoic mass that's taller than it is wide. These are all terms that sound suspicious. And an ultrasound guided core needle biopsy is done and it shows grade two ER positive invasive ductal cancer. She chooses breast conservation. Pathology shows us a 3.5 centimeter tumor with margins closest at one millimeter, grade two ER positive. I will say in our consensus statement on margins for invasive cancer, they just say no tumor on ink. So one millimeter we think is just fine. Should this woman do radiotherapy? And if so, what kind of radiotherapy is right for our patient here? Next slide. So as a reminder, let's think about the foundations of breast conservation therapy. There are six trials that compared mastectomy to breast conservation with radiotherapy, but I'm an American and we're parochial. So this is the American <laughs> trial, BO6. And this had, you know, a randomization in three arms, mastectomy, lumpectomy plus radiotherapy, lumpectomy without radiotherapy. All three arms had equivalent disease-free survival, but a lumpectomy alone was associated with a high risk of in-breast recurrence. This is a historical trial. In the modern era, our risk of in-breast recurrence are lower, but this is the trial that told us it was just fine to do breast conservation. I should say, this is one of the six trials. Uh, next slide, please. And in fact, if we put all our trials together into a meta-analysis, and here this is the um, Oxford Overview um, or Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group, um, what we see is that radiotherapy doesn't just reduce the risk of recurrence, although it does that very well, but in no negative breast cancer, it yields a small benefit with regard to breast cancer mortality. So it really is good to prevent recurrences in breast cancer. Next slide. And is 50 gray and 25 fractions enough? Or should we think about dose escalation with a boost? Well, this is the classic boost trial in women with invasive breast cancer. And what we see is that a 16 gray boost after 50 gray cut the risk of recurrence by a relative amount of about 40%. So again, it's really working in invasive cancer the same as it's working in DCIS. And if we look at this forest plot by age, what we see is that the relative benefit, it's a straight line, 
there's an equal benefit across all groups regardless of age. However, the youngest women have the highest risk of recurrence, and so they derive the largest absolute benefit, whereas our older women have a lower risk for recurrence and derive a smaller absolute benefit. Next slide, please. We also know that the overall survival advantage in radiotherapy and breast cancer doesn't apply quite equally. Instead, women with node positive disease or those with a high risk of recurrence or in trials with a high risk seem to derive a real survival advantage. We see that to the right of the graph. Whereas women who at baseline are in trials with quite low risk for recurrence seem to derive little if any survival advantage. And that leads us to the question, well, for whom can we safely skip radiotherapy? Next slide, please. And so we have five nice recent trials that all look the same. They looked at women with small less than two centimeters or less than three centimeters, depending on the trial, small, no negative, estrogen positive breast cancer, getting an anti-estrogen. In some of these trials, the median, the lowest age is 50, in some 65, in some 70, but the trials all look the same. The five-year risks were about 5% in breast recurrence or local regional recurrence versus 1%. 5% with endocrine therapy alone, 1% with endocrine therapy plus radiotherapy. By 10 years, all these double, and it's around 10% versus 2%. And we see this in every trial, but these are basically postmenopausal women, but in every single trial, regardless of age. Now, look, in an older and unhealthy person, a 10% risk of recurrence at 10 years is probably quite reasonable. And so we'll often omit radiotherapy for our elderly population. But in a 55-year-old, this isn't so great, and we tend to treat. Next slide, please. The next generation of trials, and there's a whole bunch of ongoing or just starting to publish trials, are looking at adding a biomarker to those. So like the IDEA trial and the DEBRA trial are looking at the ANCO type. Others are looking at PAM50. The Lumina trial just using KI67 has presented some early data. So we've got trials coming out trying to build upon our old ones and look into omitting radiotherapy for more patients, adding some biomarkers, but that has really yet to be proven. This is still, I'm still enrolling women to the DEBRA trial. Next slide. So she, remember that she has a three and a half centimeter tumor. She wouldn't have qualified for any of the omission trials that have been done or any of the ongoing ones. So she must do radiotherapy, but she hopes to avoid a long course. Let's see what option she has. Next slide. And this is just saying, how long does it need to take? Let's look into hypofractionation. Next slide. Here, I just categorized six randomized trials looking at moderate hypofractionation. So these are 15 or 16 treatments to the whole breast by between 2.66 to 2.67 grade. Typically, although start A and royal marginal is a little different. And what we see in every single trial was that local regional recurrence was identical between 50 gray and 25 fractions and about 40 to 43 gray in 15 to 16 fractions. Local regional recurrence identical in every single trial. And then, cut, and then next slide, please. When we look at cosmetic outcomes, depending on the trial, and the, so I should say this, acute toxicity depending on the trial, was either totally equivalent or a little better for moderate hypofractionation. And then if we look at late cosmesis and start to bring in like the START trials and stuff, it's either totally the same or, or a touch better for moderate hypofractionation. So really we should all have moved to at least moderate hypofractionation when we're just treating the breast. Next slide. What about ultra hypofractionation? So we've got the UK FAST trial, and here I'm presenting the UK FAST forward trial. I find this more practical because it's a daily treatment, five fractions. So here, there's the comparison arm was 40 gray and 15 fractions, which is a very effective and gentle regimen. And we compared it to two different five fraction regimens, 27 gray and five or 26 gray and five. They're all totally equivalent for in-breast recurrence, but 27 gray is a little bit harsher on the late cosmetic outcomes, 26 gray is barely different from 40 gray and 15. It's a tiny bit worse, but still five fractions daily, 
26 gray and five fractions is a very reasonable approach. I will say I'm now doing this for any elderly patient who needs whole breast radiotherapy. I'm not yet doing it for my young patients who need whole breast, but it is quite a reasonable approach. I think in the UK, they sure are. Um, next slide. And so here we can see acute toxicity. And what we can see is that the acute toxicity is clearly better in the, in the ultra hypofractionated regimens as compared to the moderate hypofractionated regimens. Patients really sail through. Next slide. So here we get to our second poll question. What radiotherapy regimen should she do? Should she do 50 grain 25 fractions with no boost? 40 grain 15 fractions and a boost? Should she do partial breast radiotherapy, remembering her tumor is three and a half centimeters? And if she did, would it be 38.5 in 10 fractions or 30 gray in five fractions? Once again, we're getting a, just an incredible turnout in voting here. I'm sharing the results. All right. And so what I see is the vast majority of you said option two, whole breast radiotherapy with a boost. I completely agree. She's young. She's 41 and has a big tumor. She should get a boost. She, her tumor is too large for the partial breast options. And then I no longer use 50 gray and 25 fractions to the breast anymore. It's perfectly good oncologically, but there's no reason to take that much time. The moderate hypofractionation regimens are equivalent oncologically and at least as good, if not a little better, cosmetically. So I completely agree with option two. 40 gray and 15 fractions and a boost. That boost can be delivered concurrently or it can be delivered sequentially. And how much dose for the boost do you usually use? Sure. And so there's two regimens that I think are out there. So if I'm doing it sequentially, I still usually give 10 gray and five fractions. If I'm doing it concurrently, I either choose the, um, there's an, an NRG trial that used, that went up to 48 gray in 15 for the boost, which is kind of equivalent to a 14 gray boost. So if I want to give a little bigger boost, that's what I use. And then there's some European trials that used uh, 45, 75 in 15 to the boost. So that is more equivalent to a 10 gray boost. And that's what I use for So for her, I would probably use uh, the 45, 75 in 15 fractions to the lumpectomy bed, 405 to the breast and do it concurrently. And she's done in three weeks and she's still got what's probably the optimal regimen. Great. Thank you. Sure. Next slide. So, okay. She has a slim build. We don't think we can position her prone. Does she have any risk potentially from cardiac injury from radiotherapy? And what could we do to mitigate this risk? Let's pop over to the next slide. And this is just a reminder. These are Swedish data reminding us that the heart doesn't love radiation dose. And so, you know, they looked at 2,100 women treated over a half century in Sweden or Denmark. We did not have great dosimetry. We had very rough estimates of what their heart dose was, but what we had was excellent uh, cardiac follow-up. We knew who had cardiac events and who didn't. And what we could see was a linear relationship between dose to the heart and an increase in cardiac events. And I think this tells us two things. We can't be cavalier. Heart dose matters, we have to be careful, but also, Heart injury is not inevitable from breast radiation. Avoid the heart, avoid the damage. Next slide, please. So one technique we really like, it's not the only one, one technique we really like is deep inspiration breath hold. So our patient takes a big deep breath in her chest and it pushes the heart down and away. 
And so if you look at this axial CT slice of this patient, where we can see where we're at because there are clips in her lumpectomy bed, and we can see our hypothetical tangent is getting awfully close to her heart. And right at the edge of this tangent is half dose. So if we were giving 50 gray, there's 25 gray touching the edge of that heart. Then in the bottom frame, this is the same patient at the same slice based on clips. And look how much farther back her heart is from that hypothetical tangent. And this is coming from deep inspiration breath hold. So all she did was take a deep breath and her heart moved way far away from our tangent. Now you can have what we use now is an optical scanning system. We use something called CRAD, but there's vision RT, there's other ways to do this. We use an optical mapping system that's monitoring chest wall position in space and we'll shut off the beam if the patient beams out. Some of you may have that, some of you may not. If you don't, what we used to use was summarized over in the UK heart spare trial. It cost us $300 to set up this whole thing. It was a tripod, a little laser, and a camera um, trained on that, and then a little screen outside the room. That's all we did. We spent 300 bucks, and it worked pretty well. So you could see that there was a mark we put on the patient on her side. That mark moves forward when she gets takes in a deep breath. So we know we know the distance that that mark should move. It's usually about seven millimeters. So we can shine a little laser there, make sure it's shining the right distance below that mark. That's kind of showing us she got into the right breath hold. And then we just tell her to hold it and deliver the beam. So even if you don't have a fancy optical mapping system, which we didn't have for years, you can do deep breath hold with most patients. And it's air is free, you know, and it's a great way to move that heart out of the field. And we know that's a good thing to do. Um, okay, let's look at the next slide. Oh, and then here you can see, so this is the beam's eye view and that kind of magenta structure is our heart. Next slide. This is the very same patient at deep breath hold. Next slide. And then you can see not only are we far away, but we add a little bit of cardiac shielding and we can have the edge of our field two centimeters away from the edge of the heart. And we can go from giving five or seven gray mean heart dose like I gave in residency to usually 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 gray. We can cut it down by 90% through a deep breath hold and cardiac blocking and nothing else fancy, even though you can do fancy stuff. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're now gonna contour this patient's structures in order to, um, to, deliver, to create a plan. This is the contouring atlas I like. Again, there's multiple contouring atlases. This is the European one, and it tells us a few things. The breast should be contoured five millimeters behind the skin. That contour should stop lateral to the medial perforating a mammarian vessel, so right here, doesn't need to go all the way out here. It should be uh, medial to the an uh, anterior to the lateral thoracic artery, which we can see right out here. And it should not include the pectoralis musculature or chest wall. It should sit right in front of the pectoralis major muscle. Next slide, please. So this is our third polling question. I drew this breast contour only one of these boundaries is drawn correctly. Which one is it? Is it the anterior boundary, the medial boundary, the posterior boundary, or the lateral boundary? Sharing results. Perfect. And so the plurality vote was for the medial boundary, and that is correct. Good work. And just as a reminder, the anterior boundary should be limited five millimeters beneath the skin, three millimeters if you really want, although contouring atlas will tell us five. 
The posterior boundary here should be limited by pec major, so it shouldn't be including this chest wall. This lateral boundary is going way too far back. We shouldn't be encompassing way off to the uh, latissimus. We have our um, artery here. And then the medial boundary, that's actually right on target. Um, so the plurality of you got that question right. Good work. Next slide, please. So what about constraints for whole breast? Well, this is just our same institutional constraints um, that uh, are scaled appropriately. And here I will say, um, when you, we again, we use left ventricle and left um, anterior descending artery constraints that we took from Degro and then, and then scaled. We have constraints for coverage and hot spots. Um, and then you start to also have constraints for the lung. And I'll make you a point with 3D conformal radiotherapy, you sometimes have trouble meeting your high dose lung constraints, your V20, or since this is hypofractionated, V16, because there's that sliver of lung that's probably getting full dose. When you switch to IMRT, you can be much more conformal with your high dose isodose lines. And now your challenge is low dose spray. And so the challenge with IMRT tends to be meeting your low dose isodose line. It tends to be meeting your V five or V4 in this case, because it's moderate hypofractionation. That's where we tend to run into trouble. And that's where you have to be really careful if you're doing IMRT is meeting your low dose lung constraints because it's spreading a lot of low dose around. Similarly, when we look at cardiac constraints with 3D conformal, we tend to do very well with our mean heart dose. And with IMRT, that tends to go up but IMRT tends to do a better job at really carving out the left anterior descending artery. And so for I know in Ukraine, a lot of folks are using IMRT and I think that can be a useful tool. I would caution you that you really have to look at your low dose spray across the patient and really be careful about your low dose pulmonary lines and then your mean heart dose, which tends to go up. Okay, next slide. Please. Dr. Strauss, uh, what about contralateral breast? Do you have a constraint for that? So I guess I should say, I didn't list one here. There are constraints in many trials. We do so much 3D conformal radiotherapy that that tends not to be a problem, except when you're catching some IM nodes. Um, if you're doing IMRT, you do need to contour it and be a lot more careful because you do have a lot more low dose spray. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so let's just real quick remind ourselves how to read a DVH. So you saw the constraints we used, and you don't really have to memorize them because sometimes you can just, I mean, you should memorize them, but sometimes you can just look at a DVH and know something is wrong. So which of these structures, when we look at it, just doesn't seem right? Is it the blue and red, which are lumpectomy bed and PTV? Is it the yellow, which is heart? Is it the green, which is ipsilateral lung, or the blue, which is contralateral? One of these is just not right. About 89, we've broken our voting record. <laughs> we did. It's like Olympics. Uh, so, right. ending Good the job. poll, <laughs> sharing and, uh, results. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And not only that, but um, the by far the clear winner was heart, and that is correct. And so, when I show you that yellow line, boy, you shouldn't be seeing the heart contour. First of all, it shouldn't be this high. And second of all, it shouldn't be getting full dose. You, you hopefully don't have a piece of the heart that's right getting the full target dose. So ideally that yellow contour should be coming down like that and it shouldn't be going all the way out. So yeah, the, the plurality were right. Heart doesn't look good here. Next slide, please. Oh, and we can go to the next, oh, perfect. So this is our third case, and I know I wanna be careful about my time allotment. So this is a 37-year-old woman who presents with a palpable mass in the left breast. 
and she has a core biopsy of her breast and a palpable lymph node, and they're both positive for invasive ductal carcinoma grade three. ERPR negative, HER2 positive. So her clinical stage is four centimeters, and there's something in the axilla. We would call this clinical T2N1. She undergoes TCHP chemotherapy, so Taxol, Carboplatin, Herceptin, Progetta, and she gets mastectomy and axillary node dissection. And what do we see on pathology after neoadjuvant chemo? So YP, T1B, YP, and 1A, because there's eight millimeters of cancer and two positive axillary nodes, largest focus 0.3 centimeters. So our questions now, um, does she need radiotherapy? Um, and what can we say about, um, should it include regional lymph nodes? Uh, next slide, please. So a quick point that although we have a small survival advantage in node negative breast cancer, we have a much larger survival advantage for radiotherapy in node positive breast cancer. And these were in trials that just looked at radiotherapy to the breast. Next slide, please. What about adding radiotherapy to the lymph nodes as well? And we've had two recent trials looking at this, the MA20 trial and the EORTC22922 trial, and they were a little different. MA20 was only after lumpectomy, EORTC had patients after mastectomy, but essentially they got radiotherapy to the breast or chest wall and were randomized plus or minus radiotherapy to the regional nodes, which is to say the undissected axilla, supraclavicular fossa, and the first three intercostal spaces of the IM chain. Next slide, please. And what we see in both trials is a benefit for adding regional nodal irradiation. It reduced the risk of a recurrence in the lymph nodes, reduced the risk of distant metastatic disease, and in the EORTC trial improved breast cancer mortality by about 4%. Boy, that's awfully good because that's not radiation versus none. That's radiation versus radiation with an addition. And that addition was a 4% reduction in breast cancer mortality. That's awfully good. Next slide, please. And we see the same in the most recent early breast cancer trialist collaborative group, looking at the benefit of regional nodal irradiation. It, I will say that most of these trials are these benefits really coming out of trials where the internal mammary chain is included. So I encourage people, if you're going to treat the nodes, treat the internal mammary chain. And it looks like the absolute gain is larger in node positive patients, and especially in patients with M2 disease. Uh, next slide, please. And when we look at a forest plot and we say, hey, which groups of patients benefit and which don't, every single group has a box a little to the left of the line. Every group derives a small benefit from regional nodal irradiation. The, we, our classic risk factors were not telling us of people with node positive disease, basically, who needs it and who doesn't. Next slide. And I should say that most of this benefit's really coming out of the trials where the IM nodes were included. Next slide. So can we find women who maybe don't need regional nodal irradiation or maybe don't need post-mastectomy radiation? Well, there's an exploratory analysis out of MA20 that suggests it was the people with the luminal A-like cancers, the low to intermediate grade, ERPR positive, HER2 new negative, those who were probably luminal A-like you're positive. Maybe those folks don't need regional nodal RT or post-mastectomy RT. Next slide. So here's a cool analysis that Wendy Woodward published, a retrospective analysis of a SWOG trial looking at systemic therapy. And these are patients who got mastectomy and no radiotherapy. And what we could see was if their oncotype recurrence score was low and they had N1 disease, they had a low risk of local regional recurrence. If their oncotypes recurrence score was high and or they had N2 disease, their rates of local region recurrence was high. So it suggested that patients with N1 disease and a low oncotype may be able to omit radiotherapy and or post uh, um, regional load radiotherapy or post mastectomy RT. Next slide. So this is being evaluated right now in the MA39 trial. We don't have data for it, but it does look promising. If we're ever thinking about leaving out RNI or post mastectomy RT, um, in this population is probably those with N1 disease and a low oncotype or other signs of being luminal A and getting an anti-estrogen 
Next slide, please. Now, what about neoadjuvant chemo? It's important to remember we lose some pathologic information. It used to freak us out because we'd say, we don't know what the path was before you started giving chemo. But we gain this extra information, information about response to chemo. And is that valuable? It looks like it's really valuable. Next slide, please. So we have older data out of NSABP that this was our first hint that said, boy, people who had complete response in the nodes, but especially complete response in the breast and nodes, they had really low rates of local regional recurrence with either radiotherapy to the breast and not the nodes or no post mastectomy RT. Next slide, please. And so here's a prospective series from the Dutch. This is the Boog 2010-3 trial that looked at it was prospective single arm, but it tailored the amount of radiotherapy to the response to chemo. And it said, basically, if you had a pass CR in the nodes, T1 to T2 clinically, N1 clinically, and you had a pass CR in the nodes, we're going to try to either treat you only to the breast or no post mastectomy RT. The five-year rate of isolated local regional recurrence was low. This strategy looked pretty good. Now, more than half their local regional recurrences were not isolated. This maybe isn't perfect, but still looks very promising. Next slide, please. And now we've got really early data from the NSABP B51, which is a randomized trial. So these are women with clinical T1 to T3, clinical um, node positive, who then had a pass CR in the nodes. Almost all of them also had a pass CR in the breast, and you know, 80%. And what this is telling us is, boy, the benefit of radiotherapy, if it's there, is really small and restricted to a difference in relapse-free survival, not disease-free survival or overall survival. So this is a great population to think about omission of radiotherapy. However, our patient did not qualify. She had residual nodal disease after chemo. Next slide, please. So she decides to get radiotherapy because again, she had residual disease. How long should it take? Next slide, please. And next slide. And here we have seven ongoing or just completed trials of moderate hypofractionation and regional nodal irradiation. And so far we have some early data from, we have one Chinese trial, we have early data from the Skagen one trial and the HypoG one trial. And so far every trial we have looks equivalent in all endpoints. So I am starting to routinely offer regional nodal irradiation um, with moderate hypofractionation to everybody. Um, I also do conventional fractionation. That's much more common in America, but in, in most of Europe now, I see people doing moderate hypofractionation. And if we're resource constrained, this is, I think, a great idea. And we also have the Fabric trial that just came out, which is a small like East Coast trial of the US, but again, looking like the reconstructions did fine. Um, so I think using moderate hypofractionation for everybody, even if we're doing regional nodes, is now a very reasonable option, especially if we're resource constrained, even if we're not. Uh, next slide, please. And there are three trials looking at ultra hypofractionation, so five fractions. I'm not there yet off study, but it may yet be reasonable. Um, we just don't have good data yet. Uh, next, next slide. And if we're looking for contouring atlases, I, I link a couple here that are good post mastectomy contouring atlases and contouring atlases of how we contour the regional lymph nodes, levels one, two, three, and what level four, what we used to call the supraclavicular fossa. Uh, next slide, please. What about skin toxicity? And here I will say we have a whole lot of failed trials for agents to prevent skin reaction. We have two successes, just two. We have successes looking at topical corticosteroid use. So here there's a randomized trial of mometasone versus eucerin. This is a memorial Sloan Kettering trial. They use daily bolus for everyone. So they had a lot of moist estimation. And it was clear um, that a mometasone reduced the risk of moist desquamation versus eucerin. So I like it. It's easy to use. You put it on twice a day. It's a topical corticosteroid. I'm sure they all work. So if you don't have mometasone, some other high potency topical corticosteroid. Um, bacterial decolonization also seems to work. It does look like staph colonization in the skin may contribute to skin reaction. So this is a trial that compared standard of care to decolonization with mupirocin in the nose and chlorhexidine body cleanser. And again, what it looks like is acute radiation dermatitis kind of went away. Um, I think either of these two approaches is fine. Mometasone is a lot easier. 
Next question, please. Or next slide, please. This is our final poll question. Which of the following skin regimens has strong empirical evidence that it reduces RT-related skin reaction? Mometazone, aloe vera, aquaphor, eucerin. Let's see if we can break our 90% voting record. Two more people. Oh, there Excellent. we go. <laughs> Ending the poll, sharing right. results. The vast majority of you said mometazone and you're correct. I will say, I think this probably applies to any topical corticosteroid, that's what we use. But if you're worried about skin reaction, I think that is the easiest and best way to reduce it. Again, there's more complex bacterial decolonization approaches that also work, but I think a topical corticosteroid is a great way to go. And the only thing that's evidence-based. Um, next approach, or next uh, slide. Okay. Um, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. That was such a great lecture. Um, you are an amazing teacher. Um, it was very accessible. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm glad to so be we'll, here. So we'll take the questions after uh, Dr. Siryogina presentation. So Dr. Siryogina, would you mind sharing the slides? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Natalia, for my introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Strauss, for excellent presentation, very informative uh, radiation therapy, breast cancer. Uh, today, I would like to introduce two recent clinical cases uh, from our clinics, uh, which I wanted to discuss. Uh, case one. Female, 58 years old, uh, bilateral synchronous breast cancer, uh, right-sided breast cancer, low outer quadrant, T, uh, T, 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 T2, CN0, stage uh, 2A, invasion breast carcinoma, grade 1, estrogen progesterone positive, HER2 negative, KI67, 25%. Left-sided breast cancer, upper outer quadrant, CT2, N1, stage uh, 2B, uh, invasive breast carcinoma grade 3, metastasis to the axillary lymph nodes on the left, estrogen progesterone positive, HO2 neo negative, KI67, uh, 40%. Uh, the patient had imaging, ultrasound, mammography, uh, CT of chest, abdomen, and pelvis. The tumor uh, on the left, the tumor was uh, 2.5 centimeters according to examination. Uh, lymph nodes on the right are regular. Uh, on the left, tumor was 4 centimeters. Lymph nodes on the left are en enlarged to uh, 1.5 centimeters. Uh, the patient uh, had treatment. Uh, Planned uh, near adjuvant um, chemotherapy, four cycles AC and four cycles T. Uh, but the patient uh, refused from two cycles T uh, due to poor tolerance. Then the patient had surgery, bilateral breast mastectomy, bilateral lymph nodes, dissection. Pathological report, invasion breast carcinoma of no special type. Uh, on the right, UPT1B uh, and 1A, so one out of nine uh, lymph nodes uh, was involved. Lymph vascular invasion positive. 
On the left, UPT2 and uh, UPN2, uh, so nine um, out of 14 uh, lymph nodes involved were involved. Lymph vascular inversion positive, BRC1 uh, and 2 negative. Our tumor boards uh, concluded to irradiate bilateral chest wall and bilateral leaf nodal region. So contouring CTV included the bilateral chest wall and bilateral lymph nodal region involving, involving the supraclavicular and axillary levels 1, 2, and 3. Planning target volumes were expanded to 5 mm in all directions from CTV and pulled from the skin with a 3 mm skin gap from the surface. Prescribed dose was 50 gray in 25 fractions. Treatment planning was helical IMRT. Uh, I, uh, I would like to ask uh, following questions, please, Dr. Strauss. What number of leaf nodes is recommended to be the section for the patient who remained pathological node positive after adjuvant chemotherapy? Should axillary lymph nodes on the right be irradiated in this case? What levels of lymph nodes should be irradiated in this case? And is hyperfractionation appropriate in this case? Thank you very much for my for attention. Jonathan, you are Thanks. muted. Thanks. Is it all right if I answer now? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so to the first question about how many lymph nodes should be removed, very often this patient will have a sentinel node biopsy. After all, on the right, we didn't even know she would have a positive node. She has a positive sentinel node biopsy. And now the question is, should she have an, an axillary dissection? This is actually the subject of a randomized trial right now that we don't have data from. And I will say the breast surgeons at my institution quibble about this more than just a little. I think the most standard option is to do a completion dissection right now. It's not at all clear to me that it's necessary, but I think that's probably the most standard thing. And then for me, I don't think there's a specific number of lymph nodes. I think it's choosing the, the type of surgery. And I think right now, you, following up sentinel node with a completion dissection when there's positive nodes after neoadjuvant chemo is the most standard thing. I'm not sure that it's necessary. This trial will, will ultimately tell us it's an alliance trial. Should the lymph nodes on the right be irradiated? Yeah, she had a positive node after neoadjuvant chemo. She should get regional nodal irradiation. And, and then the question is which lymph nodes, which is a great question. And I would say if she's had an axillary dissection and she had low volume disease, I think we can leave out the lymph nodes that have been dissected. So if level one or level one and two are dissected, we, we probably don't have to encompass those. We should be encompassing the undissected axillary apex, supraclavicular fossa, and internal mammary chain. And for me right now, if I'm treating the nodes, I'm treating the internal mammary chain, the upper three intercostal spaces. After all, that's where the data are. Um, and then is hypofractionated radiotherapy appropriate? I think it is very reasonable to use moderate hypofractionation. I use 40.05 and 15 fractions all the time when treating regional lymph nodes. I do not do ultra hypofractionation. So I wouldn't do this in five fractions, but I'd feel very comfortable doing it in 15. I know there's a lot of trials that have yet to publish, including the American trial, the RT term trial, but I, with the data we have, personally, I feel very comfortable. Even for bilateral breast. Even for bilateral breast. Now, the main thing, and especially if you're using VMAT, boy, you've got to be really careful about your lung constraints. And I, I will say it's worse than it used to be because these patients are getting extra agents that may themselves have lung toxicity. So this is, people can debate this, but I worry that um, TDM1 has some pulmonary toxicity. It's clear in HER2 has pulmonary toxicity. I think the immunotherapies have pulmonary toxicity. So when we're treating bilateral, we've got to be really careful about lung dose. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you for answering.
Let me introduce a case to a female, uh, 70 years old, uh, breast cancer on the left, low, low outer quadrant, uh, diagnosed in uh, 2017, stage YPT2 N1, pathological report, the patient had solid labular carcinoma. Estrogen progesterone positive, uh, HER2 negative, uh, KI 67, 20%. The patient had treatment, uh, treatment in uh, 2017, uh, near adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, FAC, uh, six cycles, and breast conserving surgery, quadrantectomy, and axillary lymph node dissection. And then the patient had IBRT, whole breast irradiation, and regional uh, nodal irradiation. Uh, then uh, the patient uh, took um, receive took letrozol, so hormone therapy until 2021. In January 2024, uh, the patient had relapse breast tumor on the left upper outer quadrant. Uh, imaging uh, was. Ultrasound, mammography, MRI of breast, and CT of chest, abdomen, and pelvis. The tumor was 1.5 centimeters, so CT1C. Uh, uh, in February 2024, the patient had uh, uh, breast conserving surgery, quadrantectomy on the left breast. Pathological report, invasion lobular carcinoma grade 2, lymph vascular invasion uh, negative, estrogen progesterone positive, HER2 uh, negative status, KI 67, 20%. Uh, our tumor board prescribe AG1 EBRT. Uh, unfortunately, the tumor bed was not marked uh, during the surgery. Uh, we decided the contouring and prescribe dose according to RTOG 1014. Uh, Partial, partial breast irradiation. CTV included visible fibrose post-operative changes. Volume uh, was uh, 67. Volume breast uh, on the left was almost uh, six, uh, 700. PTV was uh, 5 millimeters. Volume 133. Prescribed dose was 1.5 uh, gray bead. Uh, total dose uh, 45 gray. Treatment planning uh, was VMAT, PTV coverage with uh, 95% uh, ISO dose in VMAT plan. IGRT was daily, CT, uh, CBCT device, uh, Electa XVI. Heart mean dose uh, was 0 0.38 gray. Uh, left anterior descending artery mean dose was 0 0.63 gray. I uh, would you like to ask the following question, Dr. Strauss. In what cases should radiation therapy be prescribed as an alternative to salvage mastectomy for a second ipsilateral breast tumor event? How frequently do you see re irradiation after breast conserving surgery? What should be included in CTV whole breast or partial? And uh, what radiation schedules in prefer preferred for breast radiation? Thank you. Unmuting. So the first thing is, when should we be using re-irradiation instead of a salvage mastectomy? And I actually would say there's kind of three options that we have to think through for each case. Do we need to do a salvage mastectomy? Can we do repeat breast conservation without radiotherapy? And should we do repeat breast conservation with radiotherapy? And I'll say, you know, the nicest is where you have a really elderly patient. There's this long interval, but before, between recurrence, it's probably a new primary. The new primary looks really wimpy, like a T1N0 ER positive. And we say, you know what? We could do excision alone or ex in endocrine therapy. That's always great. Sometimes the, the tumor is really big and bad and you have to do a mastectomy. But sometimes you, you would need to irradiate. 
And then you can do repeat irradiation. I really like to examine the patient and see how she did from her first round of radiotherapy. If the breast is really fibrotic and lifted, if she has bad telangiectasia, if she has a lot of tenderness, I'm reluctant to double up on significant radiation sequelae. If she tolerated it really well, and especially if the tumor is not that big compared to a breast, I think repeat breast radiotherapy is very reasonable. I don't do it often, but I do it. Um, I definitely think it should be partial breast. I actually use exactly what you use. So the RTOG 1014, that, that regimen, except that was a 3D conformal regimen and you did it with IMRT and that's what I like to do. If I'm re-irradiating, I like to make those high dose lines really conformal. Some people, because BID is so difficult, some people will use a 40.05 and 15 regimen for partial breast there. I haven't yet. I've always done the 1.5 grade BID, but I also, I want people to be serious about re-irradiation. I really do think you get more fibrosis of the pec muscle. You can really get rib fractures that you just don't see the first time around. You can get real telangiectasia. So like it, it, is, it is trickier and I want patients to know the, the late outcomes are worse, um, but I will do it for women who tolerate it well the first time and need radiotherapy. So you would oh. do the whole breast, right? Not the oh, partial. I'm sorry, I do partial. I do partial. So you would do partial, okay. Yeah, always partial, just like 1014. Okay. Yeah, and you run into the challenge of partial breast, which is what happens if they don't leave clips? Then all you have right. is the seroma or surgical change. You have the location of the incision. You have prior mammography to tell you where it is. The only thing I would say is if they didn't leave clips and they did uncleplasty, and they moved the breast around, I just can't do partial breast ever. Right, in that then period. you do whole breast. Then I do whole breast. I've never re-irradiated whole breast. So I'd be clear with my surgeon, if you want me to re-irradiate, you, you can't move stuff around because okay. then we don't know where it is. Okay, got it. And so, and the question is about that this is a left side, right? Um, and it, it looks like the heart and LAD was spared very well. But let's say if, if you are worried about it and you cannot spare it well, um, do you do, Dr. Seriogina, do you do deep inspiration breath hold in Tomo Clinic? Uh, unfortunately, no. No. Um, no, no. And uh, so there was a great question in the chat. Could you give a little bit more information about this $300 breast hold control gadget <laughs> or any links or information? Yeah, you know what? If you give me a few minutes, I'll link to a paper where we describe the technique, actually. Excellent. Yeah. But I will say- That would be very useful. Oh, sure. We stole it from the British, and then we <laughs> kind of described, which is just, it's in the UK heart spare trial, which I can send you. And then we did it, and we added, we kind of had an old um, variant system that we took out of the closet and, and added to it also, which I'll show you. But um, in the UK heart spare trial, trial it's their technique and we added to it and if you want me to do this right now i'll search for this paper and i'll try to link i'll try to link it right in here uh we can maybe uh wait till the end of the lecture and i yeah. can distribute that link um yeah. so there are a few questions in the chat thank you so much dr Strauss, for answering okay. these questions um is there anything that was not answered because you were keeping track i guess there were questions about using the bolus. Do you ever yeah. use the bolus? I'll say this. The first thing is in inflammatory breast cancer, when the cancer's in the skin, I think we have to treat the skin. So I use bolus in inflammatory breast cancer um, because I can't, I can't understand why we're giving like the pec muscle and the ribs, the full dose, but not treating the skin where the cancer was. So I, I use I use bolus then. But outside of that, I gent, I bolus very gently in the post-mastectomy setting. I kind of bolus a little. I use like two millimeter brass bolus for maybe a third of the time. Some people just don't bolus. I think that's, it, bolus is more common to be used in America than in Europe. I, I don't, it's tricky. The target's really superficial, but we don't have any good data to support bolus and it clearly increases toxicity. 
So outside of the inflammatory breast cancer setting, I think it's reasonable to leave it out or to bolus very gently. And if you do that, of course, you have less skin toxicity. Okay. Um, there's also um, a question about uh, boosting mastectomy surgery scar. Yeah. And again, we do have, we now have retrospective data that it makes the cosmetic outcome worse and it makes reconstructive outcomes worse. And we don't have any prospective data to show that a scar boost helps. So I know I was trained to do it all those years ago. I no longer boost the scar. I'll say that I, um, after a inflammatory breast cancer that had a poor response to chemo, I may boost the whole chest wall. That is a rare setting. Outside of that, I don't. You save the patient time, you save yourself hassle, you save the patient toxicity. We already have really low rates of local regional recurrence and we have no evidence that the scar boost helps. So I was trained to do it, but I think it's time to give it up. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, there's also a question about using a 3D printed bolus. Do you use it yeah. in your clinic if you, you know, had to use bolus? That's really cool because we don't have the ability to 3D print bolus. So you guys are ahead of us. I think, sure, that's really cool. Where, where my clinic has special ordered it from a different company that 3D prints it is for like complicated mycosis fungoides lesions. Mm -hmm. So that are going across the face or something with irregular surfaces. We don't in breast, we use a brass bolus that conforms really well. We don't use super flap because it's so hard to kind of put over um, a breast mound. So when we do, we use brass bolus, but 3D printed sounds great. Fitting well to the patient is the most important thing. Um, but again, that's just, you're ahead of us. Otherwise maybe we would. Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, and um, there are questions about uh, what tactics uh, should we use if patient doesn't have any marks after breast surgery? Um, yeah. Should we radiate boost in this case? So this is a great question. I think there's a couple things you have to consider about this. Um, sometimes you can really clearly see the seroma, especially if the patient didn't get chemo. So they're coming straight out of surgery. They didn't close the, the surgeon didn't close the cavity. You could clearly see the seroma. I don't think you need clips, you know where you're pointing. And if you wanted to boost, go right ahead and boost. Sometimes you have no idea where the lumpectomy bed is. Like there's no clips, the surgeon closed the cavity, they had chemo for four months. I don't think you can boost, you could guess. Um, and that's okay, honestly, our boost trials just guessed, they didn't have 3D planning. You know, they pointed an electron at the scar. But so that's not crazy, but if you really need to boost, you can try. The thing I would be reluctant in is really is doing partial breast radiation if you don't know where the cavity is. That's a much more consequential decision. That's what I encourage. You know, the boost is a small dose. You're estimating a volume. If you can estimate it pretty well, that's reasonable. If you can't leave it out, that's reasonable too. It's of small benefit. Okay. Um, I do see there's this question about irradiating the dissected lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer that this is important. Not everyone is. But we did publish some data taken from NMA20. Um, if you, I think a lot of the lymphedema risk that's coming is from irradiating over the axilla that was dissected. And so the Europeans tend to avoid this. And I think that's why in their trials, like in EORTC22922, they have very little, if any, lymphedema risk coming from radiotherapy because they were avoiding the dissected axilla. So I think it's nice to avoid it if the patient really had an axillary dissection and if they had low volume disease in there. So, you know, a couple of specs and a couple of lymph nodes, great. If there's cancer pouring out of all the lymph nodes, I, I just encompass the whole thing. The other thing to bear in mind is if you don't think the patient really had an axillary dissection, if you think they just had a sampling and you see fat and nodes in that space, then I would treat it. You have to kind of know what your surgeon is doing. And if you really trust that your surgeon skeletonized those vessels and it was low volume disease, I think you can avoid irradiating levels one and two. If you think, honestly, they didn't and there's a lot of fat and nodes in there, I would treat it. Okay. Great, great answers. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Uh, maybe you want to turn on your mic and uh, video camera and ask a question in person. Please go ahead. It was very great lecture. I see thanks in the chat.
Hey, Ruslan. Hello, Hello Ruslan. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for a great lecture. I have a very simple question about uh, immobilization. Uh, do you use uh, masks for breast immobilization or no? Because uh, for me, I, I don't like masks for breasts, uh, but I know that some centers use it. That's a great question. We don't. There are some people who will take one little strip of aquaplast and put it over the chin. And so if you have your chin turned a little bit, they'll kind of have a more reproducible chin turn with a single strip of aquaplast, which is a cool idea. We haven't. But we do ver I do want my therapist to verify every day, especially if we're doing 3D conformal, that you see the light field is not touching the chin or face. And I, you can see where people make a mistake there. And you do want to be careful to not have your nodal field treating through anyone's mouth. And Jonathan, uh, so in your clinic, you mostly use 3D or IMRT for breast? We most for, I will say for partial breast now, we're using a fair amount of IMRT. Most of the time we use 3D conformal. And that's for a couple reasons. We think we can reduce low dose spray. We think we can get our mean heart dose the lowest that way. We're using deep breath hold a lot for heart sparing. And we hit insurance reimbursement problems in the States when we try to use IMRT. And so we mostly do 3D conformal. There are places that do all IMRT. There are good places that do all MRT. And I know a Memorial Sloan Kettering does this. Right. You get really good coverage. You cover that connector space really well between the top of the IM chain and where it's coming into the bottom of the supraclavicular fossa. I think you cover that a little better if that matters. Um, you, and you trade some conformality of high dose lines for a lot of low dose spread, especially in very young people. I worry about more of that low dose spread if you're going to cure them. But having said that, I think they're both very reasonable approaches. And then if we can't get a good plan with 3D conformal, we'll often do IMRT. Oh, and there... and I... oh go ahead. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I would love to answer this question about the prone position. Yeah. I love the prone position for the right patient, but the main thing I would say is people talk about heart toxicity. It's really about lung toxicity. So when you put the patient prone, especially if she has a pendulous breast, the breast falls forward, the heart falls forward too. So when you're treating the right breast in a patient with a pendulous breast, I think that works really well. If you're treating the left breast, you often find that it's not quite so clear. The breast falls forward, the heart's now plastered up against the chest wall. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Lung dose is always better. Heart dose can be better or worse. So I like the prone position for women with pendulous breasts, where it's really moving forward, where the opposite breast is pendulous enough to be pushed way aside, so you're not, your tangents aren't going through it, that I do really like the prone position and I'm the setups are tricky. So you have to be really careful. And I encourage people to cone beam CT if you have it. If mm -hmm. you haven't done it, the first time you do it, you're gonna be shocked and appalled at how bad your setup is prone once you can <laughs> see how it's looking. And mm -hmm. then that's gonna motivate you to really work on it because the setups are tricky, but they can really be great. And that's a very good uh, point about imaging. Uh, what type of imaging do you do typically for, let's say, supine setup? Sure. So for us, for supine 3D conformal, all we do is port films. And then, of course, we have our optical mapping system that we use for uh -huh. breath hold, but also for positioning. If we're doing IMRT, I do a daily cone beam. I will say that, and if I'm doing prone, I do a daily cone beam. I'll say that we worked on this with my physics group so that our cone beam, you know, we changed the frame rate and stuff so that it has a really low deposited dose on the cone beam. So we think we're adding about 0 0.7 centigrade. So that makes me think it's worth it. But I do want to be careful because cone beam imaging is dose two. But um, we like that especially prone where we really want to be picky about our setups. If you're doing prone and you see your erythema, is going somewhere you don't want it and weren't expecting it, your setups are bad. And then you've got to really work on it. Um, and anyone who wants it, I mean, we made a PowerPoint of like all the setup things we do for the prone position, I can share that. 
I oh, do that would think be great. Mm -hmm. prone setups are challenging, but they really mm -hmm. can be great if you get them right. Excellent. And for ultra uh, hypofractionation for five yeah. fractions, do you also do daily comb beam? Not if they're supine whole breast, which I do mm -hmm. for basically women over 70 who need whole breast radiation. Mm -hmm. um, but we do a lot of five fraction partial breast, and then I always do a comb beam. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent answers. Um, there's a question, how do you deal with air bubbles between bolus skin? Um, set different yeah. density values to so leave everything as is. So I would suggest switching to a bolus that's more conformal. And so like we, and we don't sim with our bolus on, we model the bolus later, but I would say this usually is a problem with super flab where like you put the bolus on and it kind of arches around a curved you know, so and then you have a lot of, not only do you have a big air gap, but that air gap is unpredictable from fraction to fraction. So whether you use, some people use bubble gum bolus or brass bolus or 3D printed bolus, any of those are probably better than super slab because I, I think it's really hard to model how it's going to sit with an air gap every day. Great, thank you. So that was a really excellent lecture. We learned a lot. Thank you both of you, uh, Dr. Strauss and Dr. Siryogina. That was excellent. Uh, and I'll see everyone in one month. Oh, Bye, everyone. one last thing. Oh, in yeah. the chat, I put the link to the paper for um, yes. the IBH techniques. Excellent. And I will also distribute this together with your slides to the whole group so people have access to it. And we'll be working on translation of the lecture. Oh, Thank you, it. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.